How are you going everyone? Hope you're doing well. And today it's time to review the animation of Dragon Ball. Was it good, bad or mediocre? As well as the peculiarities surrounding it that makes it such a fun topic to discuss. And to achieve such a task, I'll be looking at each individual studio contracted to Dragon Ball. And if you're wondering, well, didn't Toei Animation animate the whole show, why would we be looking at multiple studios? Well, that brings us to the sometimes forgotten and oftentimes a misunderstood area of anime production, outsourcing. Outsourcing was and still is a common staple of anime productions, with it being utilized as far back as the 60s. And due to the bulk of shows Toei Animation had under its belt, something that seems to have never changed would outsource much of the labor required for an episode's production to studios that specialized in areas such as photography, background art, and particularly the animation itself, both within and outside of Japan. Dragon Ball would naturally be no stranger to this process being heavily outsourced and over the course of its production cycle, in terms of its key animation that is, would have six separate studios regularly contracted to it, with their selected teams rotating between each episode. The first of these being Studio Last House, who would have quite a substantial amount of credits to their name, in fact double that out of the many other regulars. There was then Studio Live, Shindo Productions, Studio Seigasha, and Studio Junio. What makes this production somewhat unique is the fact that every one of these studios and the core teams that would make up Dragon Ball Staff List hadn't just worked with series author Akira Toriyama's designs prior, but had done so for many years. Dr. Slump, the series that would first make Toriyama a household name across Japan, would serve as a groundwork for that, with many of the aforementioned studios being brought on over the course of its five-year run. And if that wasn't enough, they would be working under the same character designer, Minoru Maeda. Again, this is certainly an oddity and adaptation, but was nothing but a beneficial one, as it allowed for a large chunk of the staff to skip the hurdles that regularly come with adapting a new work, and especially with an art style that's regarded as quite difficult to grasp, a sentiment echoed by many of its staff including the show's character designer. Even so, that comfortability with the show's designs didn't exactly equal to more creativity as I think in Dragon Ball Z to some extent, but did achieve a sense of coherence. But with the introduction out of the way, let's dive into an analysis of Dragon Ball's animation and the names behind it. Last House is certainly one of the most overlooked studios and equally couldn't be of more importance to the show's production. Whether this oversight is due to the explosive popularity of Studio Junio, that seems to overshadow just about everyone else, or because of their notorious reputation in Dragon Ball Z, brought on largely by its supervisor, even so their presence couldn't be more important being both the show's workhorse and housing the top action animators on the show. Even decades later within Dragon Ball's subsequent sequels, its ace now Toshi Shida would still hold that title. Even so, before we get to names like Shida, it's important to look at his and the mentor of many other talents within the studio, as well as the founder of Last House itself, Masayuki Uchiyama. So what's fascinating about Uchiyama is unfortunately not so much his work, but his circle of friends and mentors. Uchiyama studied under Keiichiro Kimura, one of the most prominent names in the industry in the late 60s and 70s, thanks to highly influential works such as his opening for Tiger Mask. Likewise, Uchiyama would work alongside other equally important figures, such as Yoshiyuki Mamos, known for his stylish work on Dekonju Garu, but especially his later collaborations with Hayao Miyazaki. And if that wasn't already enough, he was best friends with Yoshinori Kanada himself, who is no exaggeration to say, one of the most influential names to have risen within the Japanese animation industry, as I've mentioned many times in my videos, inspiring talents through his countless innovations such as Yoshimichi Kamada, Hiroyuki Amaishi, and a wealth of other notable names. And that influence extended so far in fact you can see it in the Dragon Ball franchise itself, through the works of animators like Kazuya Hisada, Masaki Iwane, Keisuke Masanaga, and many other talents. With that, you wouldn't be wrong for thinking that with such influences, for Uchiyama's work to perhaps be an amalgamation of those around him, or to some degree at least. After all, Kanata himself would absorb the stylistic traits of both Mamos and Kimura. Even so, despite working with the most brilliant names of that era, you could seldom find the influence of the latter names within his work, if at all. Uchiyama wasn't outright bad, but not particularly noteworthy either, and that very much defines his work on Dragon Ball. Although he was never credited to any key animation on the show, with the exception to a traffic safety special and several movies, which is somewhat ironic considering he would go on to contribute such a substantial amount in Dragon Ball Z, 
That's one area that will escape analysis on this occasion, with instead his work as an animation supervisor being at the forefront. Now his work as supervisor is often the aspect of his time on the franchise that's criticised most, and understandably so considering how it was so fundamentally different to just about every other supervisor on Z in both style and quality. Even so, this era is very much the opposite, at least initially. From the studio's debut with Episode 3, the artwork is quite congruent to the previous entries by Junio and Seigasha, and so much so it's hard to tell them apart at first glance without the aid of credits. Furthermore, Yuchiyama sticks to the model sheets and does a solid job in representing Goku as the carefree and naive character he is. The lines are rounded and the shading often features strong curves. Unfortunately, his style never develops further and continues to take the same approach over the course of the remainder of the series. This might not be such of a negative if Toriyama's style never changed either, however it did, and quite rapidly. By the time of the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai, it was a world away from those initial chapters. The heads featured far more curvature with lines becoming gradually sharper for just about every feature, and this naturally increased as time went on. That's not to say that diverting away from the source material is inherently a bad move, especially as it can provide the opportunity for a fresh and dynamic approach. However, Yuchiyama achieves neither and feels at odds to many of the other supervisors who were privy to the stylistic changes the series author was pushing for. Even still, this wouldn't have been such a drawback if it wasn't for how overbearing he was as a supervisor. Yuchiyama's modus operandi seemed to be consistency at all cost, meaning that not only were the stylistic quirks of animators suppressed to a substantial degree, but even those who were in line with current trends had their work heavily redrawn. Now, with all that said, the opening statement portraying Last House as one of the most underrated studios on the production probably sounds a little odd right about now. However, there's still another piece to this puzzle, and that's Yuchiyama's core team of animators, Akio Katada, Hidehiko Kodota, Yasuhiro Kinda, and in particular Taichiro Ahara and now Toshishida. Now, while animators like Katada and Kodota were certainly skilled on their own right, it would be Ohara and Shida who would particularly craft some of the show's most memorable sequences. What makes this duo so fascinating is that within the span of only months of being promoted to key animators, they were both already being trusted with the most climactic moments of arcs. Even more so when you consider that Shida hadn't even gone to an animation school, showing how much he would absorb from co-workers. Even still, their actual animation within those early days was rather standard for the series, but that in time would change with both refining and expanding their range of techniques. Shida would gradually shift to an emphasis on flowy movements at an energetic pace, while also developing his stylish effects work, a feature he would be known for more in time. Ohara meanwhile would later experiment with more complex camera movements adding a different sense of dynamism to his scenes, but equally great in its own rights. Movements were also more snappier in this era, but still held a stylish flair, and of course much like Shida, had a knack for animating interesting effects work. This improvement wouldn't go unrecognised by his superior either, as Ohara would be promoted and make his supervisor debut with episode 76. Although it was regrettably short-lived, only supervising three episodes, he would bring a breath of fresh air within the rigid formula of Last House episodes. That's not to say it's a drastic difference in quality or an immediate contrast in style, as you can see Uchiyama's stylistic attributes ingrained within his work to some extent, however his episodes were much more expressive and were all the better for it. Unfortunately, outside of that brief supervisor swap up, the expressivity of the duo's character art rarely made it on screen. But even despite working in such a confined environment, their personalities as animators still shone through. And as much as I've criticized Yuchiyama for his rigid approach, his greatest strength that he brought to the team was the strong relationships he built with his students and one they could attest to decades later. Junio, they're the one studio you'll see at the forefront of just about any discussion regarding Dragon Ball's animation, and understandably so. Junio likewise sported its own talented team of animators, with many who would go on to be some of the most prolific names on the franchise. Even so, there's one key aspect about their episodes that is rather underappreciated. When it came to a push for consistency, Uchiyama certainly wasn't an outlier and his approach was far from radical. I don't just mean a Dragon Ball, but within industry norms at the time. However, it was Maeda's contradictory take which made Junior's entries as distinct and rich as they were. Many of the team's top members such as Hisashi Aguchi, Misaki Sato and Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru would be allowed to showcase their stylistic quirks uninhibited. This lack of restrictions 
enhanced an episode's content whether through the climactic moments or the downtime. In retrospect, it's certainly surprising to see such an approach considering Maeda's strict reputation, but displays the strong level of trust he had between his fellow colleagues and one that certainly paid off. Now, as much as I would like to immediately dive into their body of work, it's still important to assess Maeda's own skills outside of team building and present the philosophy of his approach. So Maeda's supervisor debut on the franchise would be from its very first, certainly a logical choice considering his role as character designer, and much like his approach in that role, to bring the style of the source material as faithfully as he could on screen, it's natural he would take the same approach to supervision. The result itself would be successful, albeit he never gets particularly inventive with expressions and poses, with that aspect being more fitly attributed to those under him like Takio Ide. Even still, it's undeniable his drawing still held a strong amount of appeal, and I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say he was one of the best supervisors for the first half of the series. However, with time, Maeda too would have to come to grips with the evolving art style. His work certainly doesn't lag behind to the extent of Yuchiyama, although he likewise was approaching the series with a rounder approach. It's difficult to say if this was due to personal preference, being admittedly much more of a fan of said art style, or struggling to implement these changes in a consistent manner. Even still, it would be again his core team that would give the impression to your average viewer that the studio couldn't be more in tune. However, with that said, that's not to say Maeda was totally removed from the success of these later entries, as his eye for capable animators would be his greatest asset in this era, inviting both Hisashi Aguchi and Masaki Sato to his team. Safe to say, this would guarantee the best entries the studio had seen, and of no surprise, their most popular ones. However, with that, let's go more into the makeup of the junior team itself. Initially, the Kiei staff list was composed of quite different names. Akiko Nakano, Yasushi Tanizawa, Masayuki Aoki, and Sonami Aramaki. However, Nakano would leave after the studio's second entry. Interestingly, returning to the franchise decades later with Super, Tanizawa's time on the series would likewise be short-lived, departing after episode 15. With two members gone, Maeda would have to step in himself to fill the staffing gap until Yasuyuki Shimizu would be brought in. Now, technically speaking, Katsuyoshi Nikatsu and Takeo Ide would be somewhat part of that initial crew, making uncredited contributions on two junior entries over this era, however, just never stuck around, popping up on Last House and Seigasha episodes. It wouldn't be until a year later, beginning with episode 50, they would properly integrate into Maeda's core team. Naturally, having an animator like Ide, who can draw just about every type of expression you could think of, and arguably one of the best on the production at doing it, while having simultaneously one of its most lively animators, would mark the first stage of their golden era. However, before going further, I would like to touch on Nakatsu a little more and what he brought to the team. It's no exaggeration to describe him as one of the most skilled animators on the production at large. So noteworthy, in fact, that his talents would be recognized by the series author himself, and not just in words only, but to the extent that it would lead to a collaboration between the two. Akira Toriyama would be so impressed with the result, to the point of proposing the cut through, act as an assistant cleaning up his rough sketches. Therefore, it should be of no surprise saying that not only was the desire to bring the manga to life there from the start, but that he was one of the best at it. However, this prioritization wouldn't be at the expense of animated movement, if anything, the cut through scenes feature the most of it. His acting held a level of nuance to the movements, presenting a more looser feel to each one, and with that, a certain charm distinctive to him. It's honestly hard to imagine Junior's entries, or should I say the series at large without him, but there are two other names that equally come under that description, and that is of course Masaki Sato and Hisashi Aguchi. Although both of their entrances would be ironically rather tame, it would be several episodes later, specifically 112, that you would get a proper taste of their work. The change in art style and the general quality to their drawings is much more noticeable and couldn't fit the nature of their scenes more. Quite quickly, Sato's talents would be recognized and would find himself on many of the big climactic moments of episodes going forward. Funny enough, it wasn't his actual animation that was particularly noteworthy. Of course, that's not to imply it was bad either, but rather his impressive art that stood out. Sato's expertise in making still drawings appear so expressive and distinct made his work hard to miss. And in a series that involves quite a considerable amount of exposition, and with that often quite limited character acting, certainly not an anomaly in the environment of TV animation, having expressively detailed character art is a nice counterweight to make a scene still carry impact, and it's hard to note a time in his work that it didn't. Of course, the question that hasn't been answered is how? How did his work stand out amongst his equally skilled peers? 
After all, he wasn't the only one who attempted to replicate the style seen in the source material. Well, the simple answer is that not only did Sato faithfully replicate said stylistic notes incredibly well, but more so he enhanced them to a substantial degree. This expressive reimagining would be approached with bold line work, three tones of shading, and a concise shape design for it. That's not to say said stylistic works were entirely unique to the series, but rather that it had never also been consistently present in an animator's work. The most fascinating aspect of all, however, is what a unique voice he had despite only being several episodes in. Not only had Sato adapted to the style instantly, but already found such a distinctive method to approach the series with. It should be of no surprise Sato would quickly have a strong influence over Dragon Ball's staff with many, Nakatsu included, changing up their art styles to match him. Now with all that said, let's flick back to his close friend and colleague, Hisashi Aguchi. Although his own drawings were appealing in their own right, Aguchi would rely more on character acting, making for some charming moments with the cast. And much like Nakatsuru, his work followed in being more dense animation-wise than many of the other core staff, adding an extra touch of liveliness to junior entries. Of course, when looking at his resume, animating light-hearted scenes certainly wasn't new ground for him. However, it was quite the contrary with action, having very little experience with it up until now. And so with a series that very much was filled with it, would be a great fit to experiment with more action oriented scenes. This clip here from episode 139 is an example of him doing just that, and sits as some of his most interesting work on the series. The camera work is incredibly dynamic, with Higuchi pulling off a series of camera rotations around the stadium floor, providing a feeling of speed and unpredictability to the attack. It's equally packed with great poses and some very intense expressions throughout. Overall, with such a strong team of animators assembled, Junio's entries going forward would be their best, amassing quite a fan base with many who'd codify their work as the standard of good Dragon Ball animation. Studio Live seemed to parallel Last House in more ways than one. Whether it be through garnering quite a similar reputation and time for their supervisor's unrefined approach, or while, ironically, looking hardly out of place in this era. Either way, you'll likewise seldom find praise for live. Now, in regards to being underrated, I wouldn't go as far to add this as another tick to their list of similarities between the two, with their entries being quite subpar. Even still, they did host a notable creator, while not particularly well known at this time, would etch out quite a successful career. Firstly though, let's kick it off with the animation supervisor for Studio Live's Dragon Ball team, Yukio Ebisawa. His debut would be with Episode 5, and much in line with many of the other supervisors, it doesn't deviate away from the character sheets for the most part and holds appeal, although that is somewhat debatable going forward. Unfortunately, his drawings can be somewhat inconsistent in quality, featuring some quite odd anatomical proportions. He especially seemed to struggle with profile shots, often drawing the top of the head rather large, with a strong curve outward and sitting a fair way back from the jaw. Likewise, his tendency to draw tall, triangular-shaped heads seems to remain the same as in his Dr. Slump days. It's more so older characters that seem to be subject to this odd trait, however it is rather tame in comparison to his later contributions, so I guess we should be thankful for that. Still, despite his unorthodox approach, he did attempt to stay in line with the manga and was somewhat successful, adapting the more angular stylization in his episodes, albeit somewhat exaggerated at times for better or worse. Even despite these artistic shortcomings, his episodes didn't suffer the same fate as Last House in terms of limited creative freedom, acknowledging the talents of those under him, thus being more lenient with corrections. As a result of this approach, Studio Live entries are all the richer for it, featuring a decent amount of expressive and appealing character art. Of course, Ebisawa isn't exempt from his fair share of questionable corrections, but it is to a lesser degree than many supervisors. Outside of the supervisor role though, he would also be a regular animator and even storyboard on occasion. I wouldn't say his work in either field is exceptional, although it's undeniable he was versatile and fast. It's no secret that TV anime schedules are quite demanding, so to supervise, storyboard and contribute key animation is no easy feat. Now, you wouldn't be mistaken for assuming his work in the latter areas to be likewise quite subpar, and in regards to his own key animation, you would be correct, being rather conservative and quite formulaic. His storyboards, however, don't share the same fate. By this time, he was more than familiar to the role, and that does show. One particular quirk that stands out most is his use of long shots, 
to convey a sense of scale through contrast between characters and their surrounding environment. The strongest example of this is his board for the sections involving Goku's training in episode 131. There's already a natural sense of grandeur to the lookout thanks to the original design by Akira Toriyama, but that's further enhanced through Ebisawa's angles and his placement of characters within said environment, making for some quite atmospheric moments within his work. Now, I mentioned the live team would host a notable name, and with that final bit on Ebisawa, there's no better time to discuss their work, or should I say her work. For whatever reason, the composition of Studio Live's team was quite small with a couple of Toei's own animators assisting in their episodes for various periods. Over the span of the series, there would be only two key animators that would be there from essentially beginning to end. Of course, Yuhio Ebisawa, but also Marie Tomonaga. Tomonaga was a fairly new face to the industry and with Dragon Ball marking some of her very early work within it. At this point, Tomonaga, as per norm for new animators, had been working as an in-betweener at this time for two years. However, after the studio's first entry on Dragon Ball, she would receive her promotion to the position of key animator. With her initial contributions in this role, she was still being taught by her mentor Ebisawa, fundamentals such as how to time out her cuts and communicate weight with action scenes, so naturally it's quite rudimentary work and she would probably be the first one to tell you that. What more so saw the most progression while she was on the series, however, was her character art. If you ever notice a drawing that's very appealing in a live entry, there's a high chance that's her. She was quite versatile in her approach, adding charm to the smaller characters like Goku and Oolong, through more rounded lines and soft expressions, while also being able to draw very intricate drawings you wouldn't be mistaken for confusing with Sato or Aguchi, and there's a high chance there was inspiration drawn from the latter. This wouldn't go unnoticed either, gaining praise from somewhat of a superstar in the industry at the time, Masaki Suda. Unfortunately, after the conclusion of the series, she wouldn't be there for its sequel being moved over to many of the studio's other contracted work. However, would go on to have quite a successful career, landing herself on other big Toei titles such as Sailor Moon and as a character designer no less, while also becoming a fan favourite supervisor, and would go on to be quite a notable figure in more recent years on Dr. Stone. Her presence on the series may go unnoticed by most Dragon Ball fans, but it was certainly welcome regardless. Studio Seigasha. They would be regarded as one of the top studios on the franchise thanks to their distinctive work on Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT. However, this era is more so their quieter one. Somewhat understandable considering two of their future top action aces, Naoki Tate and Kazuya Hisada, would be still in betweening at this time. Even so, the team would bring quite a unique flavor to the production. One of the main figures in this era would be Tomokichi Takauchi, being both a mentor to the Seigasha crew as well as a regular supervisor until later becoming further involved contributing key animation. Takauchi's entry into the industry would be somewhat unique in simply how much of a latecomer he was entering in within his 40s, and considering the toll working within the confines of a TV anime takes, you would think that by the time he reached his 50s, he would have called it quits and moved on. Instead, it was much the opposite, being in his mid-60s by the time he lands on Dragon Ball, and generally speaking, that experience did show. There's a firmness to his lines and shading quite distinct to any other supervisor, and gradually Takauchi would continue to push into a more bolder look for character art increasing his use of three tones for shading, with precise hatching layered on top. Somewhat ahead of his time in one sense, as this would become a standard approach in Dragon Ball Z, and likewise an appropriate one in this era, considering the darker tone the source material was gravitating to, a feature of Takeuchi's early work that's severely overlooked. With all that said, it wouldn't be all that surprising to say the principle of boldness was a core cool feature of how he handled movement. Characters' actions would be paired with a stack of speed lines and large effects to represent contact between objects, whether it be a character's foot touching the ground or a fist connecting. Then finally add his love for impact frames and drawing exaggerated expressions into the mix, and you have a formula for some powerful action with a rather economic use of drawings. The only downside to his work excelling further was his posing and linear nature of said movements, giving a rigid feel to his animation. Even still, the fact that he would try to add a lot of movement and detailed choreography all while supervising is still an impressive feat. In regards to his students, many would inherit his philosophy, improving it in its weakest areas. One key animator that fulfills that description best would be Masahiro Shimanuki. What makes his case an interesting one is that, even despite being only just promoted to a key animator, 
by the time of his second episode, you can already distinguish his work clearly from his colleagues and particularly Takeuchi. One trait that quickly differentiates his work most from his mentor was how he conveyed hits and the general pacing to his work. Instead of quick impacts, Shimanuki would hold the key pose with a loop of several frames, tightly spaced together and timed out on mostly ones, twos and threes. In drawing count, it's not that much higher than someone like Yuki or Ebisawa, but his work definitely gives you the impression that it is. For whatever reason, on the majority of Seigasha entries, he would handle the lowest amount of cuts on episodes, so his presence is less felt in this era. I doubt this is an oversight in recognizing his talents, although I'm unsure of the exact reasoning. Either way, he would evolve quite quickly regardless, fine-tuning his work. By the time of the Red Ribbon Army arc, you can see Shimanuki developing another feature that would be a consistent trait in his toolbox, and that would be his effects work. In principle, you can see the influence of Takeuchi with the amount of detail he would place in them, although once again would still be distinct from him, opting for cleaner and larger shapes to smoke clouds in contrast to the bold and sketchy look, very much a carried over approach from the 70s. By the time of the show's final arc, he had grown considerably with all the above mentioned features in full effect, and to no one's surprise would be their top ace. With that said, it's important to still shine the spotlight briefly on Seigash's two other regulars, Yoku Izuku and Masako Misumi. While their work perhaps never draws the attention Shimanuki's does, it's great in its own right leaning to quite a similar approach to action and character acting, being driven by exaggeration through very expressive drawings with wide spacing. Not entirely complex, but certainly made Seigasha entries a pleasure to watch. Shindo Productions The studio would be formed by a former Mushi Pro member Mitsuo Shindo and would make their debut with episode 7. Shindo himself would fill the supervisor role, and as is the trend for just about every supervisor to have worked on the series, his drawings don't really veer outside the show's set designs and feature a nice amount of expressivity and charm, although his adherence to that does become a bit more debatable with time. More specifically, for Goku, the eye shape would lean more to ovals, pupils would be much larger, eyebrows would be longer, and the jawline becoming completely rounded off. I'm hesitant to label it as an outright bad approach, but I struggle to say that it's the most appealing one either. Outside of supervision though, that's as far as his involvement went, never contributing any of his own key animation. The names that would make up that team however would be Noriko Itani, Terohisa Ryu, Tsuyaku Yamamoro before being moved back to in-betweening and then leaving the series altogether, then Kazuko Hirose, Tadayoshi Yamamoro, and Noriko Shibata in the last half of the series. The team itself were adept, although it's hard to pinpoint the work of individual names, considering Shindo seemed to hold to consistency, rather than letting his team express their style, and for the most part, their animation never deviated from the norm, making it a further difficult task. However, there was one animator that would make sure he stood out, and that was Ryu. One of his prominent trademarks was his interest in camera work. Whether comedic or action-based, you would commonly find him going out of his way to include full camera rotations or low-angle zooms, to give that extra bit of emphasis behind a particular moment. Now that sounds cool on paper, but requires a fair amount of technical skill to execute, and even more so within the confines of a weekly TV series. Outside of Ryu, Shindo Pro Entry seldom stood out on the production, with rather their work on Dragon Ball Z being their golden era. Now that's certainly in part the Shindo himself, however his mentoring of a young Tadayoshi Yamamoro would be arguably his most noteworthy achievement, who in time would completely transform their episodes leading to said era, and Sid is one of the biggest names on the franchise at large, and very much remains so to this day. Katsumi Aoshima She's somewhat of an outlier to every supervisor mentioned thus far, for the simple fact she wasn't employed by a particular studio, most likely freelancing, but more so that she animated a large portion of episodes herself. That fact alone makes her an important figure in the series production, but more so considering how good those entries were. Alshima's debut would be with episode 8, supervised by Minoru Maeda, although technically was more so a Last House episode than anything, considering how many of their staff were placed on it. However, episode 14 would provide a much clearer look at what she had to offer. In terms of its animation, it's quite a noteworthy entrance. Neat effects work, a fair bit of background animation, and some goofy character acting to top it off, 
made for a pretty engaging episode. Alshima's work had always been rooted in lively animation displayed through exaggeration, making a perfect fit for a series like Dragon Ball. On top of that, her drawings, while perhaps don't stick as rigidly to Maeda's sheets, I guess another note to a list of differences to every other supervisor, seem to perfectly capture the charm of Toriyama's characters, with her take on Goku simply being one of the cutest, and in time showed she was equally capable in portraying the story's most evil ones. This skill set seemed to be quickly acknowledged by the show's producers, and in a big way, being selected to handle the arc's finale. Quite a task for a solo animator, especially considering it's action-centered, which likewise displays a level of trust on their end. I think if I was to label anyone with the title of underrated on Dragon Ball, it would be Aoshima. Generally speaking, Dragon Ball in terms of its animation was fine. The staff benefited from a good schedule, and even more so from the fact that many were already familiar with Toriyama's style. It was never particularly ambitious either, for the most part, and the general output by the majority of its staff was rather standard for many weekly anime productions at the time, with more so Toriyama's character and story, which carried the most influence. Even still, thanks to the show housing a solid list of young, talented directors, many of the more conservative moments, animation-wise, were elevated to be still quite memorable visually, whether it be through compelling composition, dynamic perspectives, or distinctive colors. Regardless, I appreciate their contributions all the same, and it's still, of course, an enjoyable anime thanks to being strong in many other departments. But with that final note, though, brings us to the end. So thank you everyone for watching, this probably sits as one of my biggest videos now, so it definitely took a lot of time to put together, so I'd appreciate it if you left a comment on what you thought of it, but yeah, with that, I'll be off for now, might do a smaller scale video next week, but yeah, with that, I'll see you later.